thank you. What just happened? How did that make you feel? I invite you all to make a mental note of what just happened in your body. While we take the next few ten minutes or so exploring this idea that what you might have experienced could have been encoded in your subconscious, might have been determined by your early childhood, or even your ancestral lineage. But first, that was really super stressful, so if you wouldn't mind joining me in taking a nice long deep inhale and exhaling, letting that go. And thank you so much to the person that called out. That was really very delightful. So, this idea that we can inherit learned behaviour it's actually really fascinating to me and really changed my life. Scientists back in Emory University, the people that first set me on fire with this idea, they'd been working in inner city communities and they had... And they wondered what was going on here. They saw these children perpetuating these cycles and it just seemed to them that there was so much more going on than just them mimicking their parents' behavior. So they went back to the lab and they thought, well, let's study this phenomenon in the lab. And so they did a mouse model. So they took these mice and they exposed them to this sweet, like cherry, almond-like scent. And at the same time, I apologize, but they gave them a small electric shock. So some of you might be familiar with Pavlov's famous dog experiments and maybe recognize that over time, these mice become conditioned to fear this smell. So every time they smell this smell, they get this electric shock, and over time, all they need to do is smell this scent, and all of a sudden, their body goes into this shock response. But what was really, really fascinating about this study is that the offspring of these mice also inherited this response, despite never, ever having previously been exposed to an electric shock. The grandchildren inherited this response as did mice conceived through in vitro fertilization with sperm from the original conditioned mice. So let's just take one moment to think about the implications of this work. These animals, they exhibit an irrational and visceral response to stimuli which they can have no conscious memory of. How is that possible? And what does it mean for our experience of the human condition? So what they observed in this study were actual structural changes to the brain physiology of these mice. And what's more, they linked these changes to DNA methylation. They called it a reversible epigenetic chemical modification to the primary DNA sequence. I remembered reading that sentence when I first saw this study, and that word, this one word, reversible, just jumped out at me and set my imagination on fire. When I first started learning about this concept of the dynamic genome, I was amazed my career had begun when the first draft of the human sequence was being published, and I'd always understood genetics to be the code that gets passed down from our mum and dad, and it determines our physical form. But even in my early career, I was somewhat confused and perplexed as to how the only part that mattered of this three billion unit genome that encodes our DNA was this 10% that gives us our skin color or our eye color or determines whether or not we can roll our tongue. Mm -hmm. I won the run tongue rolling lottery. I'd love to see if we have any other tongue rollers out here. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> cool. It's a terribly useful skill. <laughs> My personal obsession was with this 90%. It was the space between the protein coding genes, and it had been designated as junk DNA. So imagine my delight when I started reading about epigenetics, which predominantly works in this junk, and I found the questions 
on the answers and many, many more questions than answers. But all of the answers to these questions that I'd been curious about my whole life, this nature versus nurture debate, or life at the interface of environment versus parental lineage. So I like to think of epigenetic modification as the dimmer switches of the genome. Or sometimes, if I'm feeling particularly out there, I like to think of them as the genome's DJs. They light up genes which need to express themselves in a given moment or down-regulate genes that aren't needed at a moment in time. One of my absolute favorite, favorite experiences, which just showed me the magnitude of this incredible technology that we have within us, was on a recent visit to a lab. And so this lab it was a lab that um, specialized in transplantation genetics, and they had taken some skin cells from a human being and grown them up in a Petri dish. And so some of you may already be aware that um, skin cells look like skin cells and not heart cells or liver cells or toenail cells because all of the genes that tell them you're a skin cell are switched on, and all of the genes that tells them that you're any other kind of cell are switched off, and epigenetics determines that. So I'm looking down this Petri dish, down the microscope into the Petri dish, and these skin cells that they've taken, they've switched off all of the genes that tell this skin cell it's a skin cell, and they've switched on genes to tell it it's a heart cell. So here I am in the lab, just wondering what I'm going to see, kind of trying to look clever and thinking, oh my goodness, what if I don't see anything? And then all of a sudden, the cells in this Petri dish go boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. These skin cells had transformed into heart cells which were beating of their own accord, like epigenetic alchemy. And we've only just begun to scratch the surface of what this could mean for us and our experience as human beings. One of my absolute favorite studies that have really started to look into this came out of the NIH, NIH last year. And um, what they discovered was truly remarkable. They found an epigenetic biomarker that was a biomarker for cancer. It was um, for multiple cancers. So oftentimes we think of there being a breast cancer gene or a pancreatic cancer gene. This was a biomarker that encoded multiple different types of cancers. And what they found was the decreased activity through methylation of a gene called ZNF154. So the name of the gene isn't that interesting to me, but the function of this gene really is fascinating. It is a tumor suppressor gene. And the methylation of this gene decreased its function, and that corresponded with the presence of cancer in the people in this study. And, you know, this is where the idea of dynamic and reversible can really get us excited. So one great study which demonstrates just how dynamic and reversible this these um, technology can be was uh, came out of um, a lab in Massachusetts just recently. And it was a study that took some participants and they told them to sit down for 15 minutes and deep breathe and repeat mantra and meditate. And then they analyzed how their genes responded. And the results were truly remarkable. After just 15 minutes, the genes linked to inflammatory response and stress-related pathways got switched off or dimmed down. And genes associated with energy metabolism and mitochondrial function and maintaining the telomeres, the bits at the end of our chromosomes that make us youthful, were switched on. So how does this relate to us as we sit here right now? Well, one of my favorite toys right now is something called a molecular clock. And it recognizes how epigenetic signatures are related to the health of a cell by evaluating which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off at a given moment in time. So what if we could observe the impact of our environments and our activities on our molecular clocks. How might we respond or how might we move through life differently? I've had some pretty interesting experiences since I became interested in this field of work. So there was this one time at band camp. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> thank you, but I wasn't at band camp. I was out dancing with a dear friend. 
And I was really excited. I was wearing this cool leather jacket, had this flower power bandana. And there I was in my car. We pull up to the venue, walk into the parking space. And I see that there's an amazing parking space just available right at the entrance of the venue. So I back my car in and I'm feeling really pumped. It was a princess parking spot. So excited. And I look up and there's this gentleman standing kind of in front of my car. And his face is sort of red with rage. And he's got like spittle coming out of his mouth. And he just looks so furious. We're both confused because we've just been in this state of fun and bliss as to what's going on. And it took us a while to discern what was happening. But uh, we finally managed to establish that I'd taken this parking spot that um, he'd been waiting for. So naturally, I'm super embarrassed and apologetic and I drive out and go off and find the next parking spot but as I'm driving away it took every single fiber of my being to not stop my car get out walk over to this car tap on his window and say excuse me sir would you please give me a urine specimen What I wanted more than anything else in that moment was to see whether I might be able to detect a molecular signature of his road rage. (laughs) But really, (laughs) I do. I just wonder, was his irrational response, was it programmed from a space of ancestral lack? Or maybe was his anger from childhood neglect? And I wondered, maybe, just maybe, might he have modulated his response had he known how much damage he was causing to his cells in that moment? He was accelerating his molecular clock. But really, I just wonder how we might move through the world differently if we had a better understanding of both our own subconscious programming and the subconscious programming of those with whom we share this earth. So my dream is to offer these tools as a means to empower individuals to know where their blocks lie and feel into what environments and activities are really serving them as they move through life. My personal favorite expression of self-love is through yoga and meditation, but I strongly believe in the power of anything that can take us away from this idea of our small, finite, limited self to bring ourselves back into a place of balance. Like music, just last month I was at this festival and there was this moment at the end of Pink Set and the harness falls from the sky and we all know what's about to happen and the two girls in front of me, they just turn around and look at me and they say, it's really happening! And I'm like, I know! It was so exciting as I'm looking around at the audience and pinks flying through the air and singing and flipping and dancing. And I just couldn't help but wonder in that moment, what was happening to the molecular clocks of those people in these expressions of fun and of joy and of love? Being fully immersed in a given moment in time, using the gift of our five senses to be fully present. Or nature. I've just come back from Zion National Park this past weekend, and I can still feel in my body the majesty of those gorgeous red rocks and see that sun peeping over as it rose in the morning and lit up the fall colors, making the river glisten. Every day as we drove into the canyon and out of the canyon, there was this little poster on the bus, and it was a quote by a guy called Edmund Ab- Edward Abbey, and it said, Wilderness is not a luxury, but a necessity of the human spirit. So what is the necessity of your spirit? And can we use the tools of genetics to help us discern them because the tools of genetics are powerful. They make me feel powerful. They give this Welsh, British, Indian, 
Asian scientist, yogi, procrastinator, millennial, a sense of my own personal identity and a sense of my belonging, a sense that can transcend any label and any international border and tell me the full story of my personal connection to every single being that ever was, every single being that ever will be, and every single being that is. It's a literal common thread through the ages. We have scientifically corroborated evidence of the interconnectivity of every single organism on this planet. And the tools of genetics make me feel like I have a say in my journey. They give me insight into where I can focus my intentions for shifting my personal physiology to create the life that I want to live. So as we close, I'd like to invite you to imagine. This is one of my absolute favorite quotes ever. Imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and everything there ever will be to know and understand. So, let's imagine. Let's imagine that we can see where our ancestral programming or early childhood experience is encoded in our cells. Let's imagine that in any given moment, we can make the choice to heal and find balance. Imagine that we have the genetic tools to enable us to discern which of our environments and our activities contribute to our greatness. Imagine that we can see the molecular imbalances of individuals whose irrational and subconscious behaviors are contrary to their greatness. Imagine how we might react differently the next time we're road raged or hey, even stage frighted. As we gather here today in a city recognized as a model of progress and growth in a world which is in such desperate need of progress and growth, I invite you to imagine a future where these ideas hold true. A future where each and every one of us is empowered to remember our own sovereignty. And each and every one of us is empowered to remember the sovereignty of every single person with whom we share this earth. And each and every one of us is empowered to remember the infinite magnitude of our innate healing capacity. It's our birthright. For we can be the change we wish to see in ourselves. And my feeling is that the world will follow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.